Welcome to the Closed-Minded Podcast, where we read with an open mind in order to close it again on something solid. Today's guest is Dr. Robbie Castleman. She is a professor emeritus of biblical studies at John Brown University in Salem Springs, Arkansas, uh, where she has taught for the last 17 years. Dr. Castleman is the author of the book, Parenting in the Pew, Guiding Your Children into the Joys of Worship. Uh, She first published this back in 1993, building it around seminars that she gave and, in fact, still gives uh, within local congregations to help parents be intentional in training their kids in how to worship. We discussed today some of the theological foundations of worship and why kids need to be in the service instead of being shuttled off to some other programming. And we also cover tips and strategies to help you succeed while you parent in the pew. Look, I know that uh, not everybody in my audience is a Christian. I've got some non-believers that listen to this show as well. Um, Look, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I encourage you to reflect on the idea that we are all worshiping something and that we as parents will train our children to worship also. Uh, It's really not a matter of whether we teach them to worship, but what it is that we're teaching them to worship. Uh, If you are a Christian and you're a parent or a grandparent, you will definitely enjoy uh, hearing from Dr. Kassman today. Uh, Although she retains her own theological home base in Presbyterianism, uh, virtually all of her material is applicable to any denomination or any worship service style. One note of housekeeping before we begin, uh, a few times the audio gets a bit faint. Uh, We were dealing with a loud furnace in the background and occasionally Dr. Kassman spoke softly. Um, As an amateur audio engineer, I did my best to remove as much noise as I could and to boost her voice, uh, so hang in there in a couple of uh, low spots. Also joining our conversation is my good friend Josh, who was last seen on Episodes 1 and 3. And then finally, links to any books mentioned in this episode are available on the show notes page at closedmindedpodcast.com slash 7. Now, here is the conversation Josh and I had with Dr. Robbie Castleman. Dr. Castleman, welcome to the Closed Minded Podcast. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. As a former student, you can now call me Robbie. <laughs> I don't know if I can get used to that, but I'll, I'll try it. Josh on the, can go right ahead into it since he didn't know you before. All right. Well, we want to talk about this book that you have written and I'm sure has continued to percolate in your mind over the last 20, 25 years, um, Parenting in the Pew. Um, so if you could just give us a brief overview of, of what it is, what the basic point is, and why you wrote it. I'll start with why I wrote it. Um, I was not raised in a Christian home. My parents were terrific, loving. Uh, I, I grew up in a great home, but I'm a West Coaster, and my parents had never heard the gospel, and neither had I. And I became a Christian in college uh, through the ministry of a couple um, that had invited me to a Bible study in their home. So I had a lot of good parental modeling in front of me, except for what to do with kids in terms of spiritual development. Now my husband was the, he was a PK and his mother had been a missionary and so he knew tons of stuff about raising children in the uh, light of God's word and things like that. Of course, we were just on the same page with that, but he was also not parented in the pew. Uh, his mom died when he was eight years old, and so oh, wow. he couldn't help me figure out how to do that part of parenting um, because it had not been done for him in a certain way. And so I began, the book did not proceed my thinking about this. It grew out of how people began to notice the change in my children and their responsiveness and their um, interactiveness with the worship service. And people Mm -hmm. can say, what is that that you're doing with Robin Scott during the the fill-in-the-blank? And so I tell them, well, I'm teaching him how to sing. So, And then people say, would you tell my friend that and then tell my friend's friends that? And so then the seminar that I still do grew out of those questions, things that people really could do, that they had seen how it helped my children really be engaged by God and in return respond to God in a worship service. And so um, 
years after that, as the kids grew older and whatever, I was on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And InterVarsity Press, um, I had written a lot of things before this, and they knew I could write, and they asked me to write a book for InterVarsity Press, and I said, about what? And they said, what are you passionate about? And so I started telling them about worship and how worship belongs to children, too, and the change I've seen in my kids and all that. And they said, write it down. Write it down. Everything that you just said to me, I'm going to go home and try that with my kids, you know, the editor told me. And so I said, oh, really? Okay, I'll, I'll just put the seminar on paper. Okay, yeah, I'll think about how I can do that. And so now it's, you know, been a bestseller and it's uh, and it's uh, uh, third uh, updated and revised edition. Yeah. So, so you developed the seminar first, just out of the being in the trenches, and then that turned into the book? Yep, yep. The book came last. My own parenting was first, and then people started noticing in our congregations the difference in our kids. What are you mm. doing here? And... I noticed that you leaned over at this time, that you whispered something to your kid. Um, what are you saying? What are you doing? Uh, you know, they just ask questions. What are you doing? Well, try this with uh, Johnny. Uh, yeah, the kids really love to sing now. Uh, you know, one of the things that is in the book is even your, their toddlers, they're, they're preschoolers. They don't even read yet, but they're standing up singing, you know. How do you do that? Well, we practice things at home, but then also, if it's a new song or a harder song and the words are hard, we just tell them to la la la, sing to the, the rhythm and the, and the music, and just la 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 because we're just singing, making a joyful noise before the Lord, you know, and involving uh, children and doing that. So let me ask you this. I know that you've done a lot of study on the, just the history of worship throughout the church. Um, yeah. I guess, how long has it been the case where we've sort of shuffled children off to the side or had, you know, dedicated programming for them? I guess, what was it like in the past and how did we get to this, the, the thing that you're writing against now? Um, I think it's fairly recent. Um, and it's almost exclusively true in white culture, Caucasian culture. Mm -hmm. the Hispanic, uh, Asians, um, African Americans, you know, you know, just in our culture, do not dismiss their children. Um, I think it's been because of the encroachment of commodification in our culture. This, the age segregation that is really heralded in, uh, successful marketing um, and we've let that shape some of the church where you have gap and baby gap I mean at my age I would no more ever walk into Abercrombie and Fitch than maybe people would stare I mean we don't we're very age segregated in white culture particularly but in then even across the board we're segregated in um, age, age cultures uh, and especially true in the church. Now, there is a place for Sunday school, so you can do appropriate education for different ages of children. But there needs to be, across the board, not just in worship, times in our community of faith where the whole generation can laud the life and love of the Lord to the next generation. So we need to have family night suppers that include children. We need to have Bible studies in our home where everybody's kids come to and learn how to participate in that dynamic in, in kid-shaped ways. But they see their parents studying scripture and taking that seriously in their own homes, things like that. We, um, we need to let the um, elderly in the church have interaction with our kids to hear their stories of long-term faith, and especially junior yeah. high they need a faith that's older than they are. And, of course, the whole church needs to recognize that we belong to something that's far older than we are, that um, we do still need. I mean, when did all this, uh, including children and everything, start? Well, read the Old Testament. That's where it's <laughs> So we're all Israel stood before the Lord 
with their wives and their children. And I mean, sometimes when I'm asked to preach in certain congregations that will allow that, I'll, I'll do an exposition of Second uh, Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, and Jeremiah, I mean, um, Josephat, as he stands before the people and offers up a very rare, uh, humble, humble, beautiful prayer for God's rescue. And then he goes on, and the people listen to him. All the people are there. They mention it several times. And yet the enemy of four armies are about 20 miles away. And they're gathered for a worship service to listen yeah. to the prophet. And the outcome of that is it's gorgeous, where it says, Joseph had been acquiring from the army. What does that tell us? If worship comes first, yeah. if we die this day, if we don't live this day, which it plus where the God told him to stand was at the back end of a cul-de-sac, gather your people at the back end of this very vulnerable cul-de-sac, and these armies are still marching, and he puts the choir in front of the army because it's going to have to be God that rescues us this day. And it says later on, you know, in the chapter that the Lord set an ambush. The Lord set an ambush against the four armies at the end of the other off. But the children were there to see that. And the choir, you know what they sung? This is amazing. You know what they sang? I guess I should say. The love of the Lord is everlasting. Mm -hmm. It never ends. Yeah. That's a beautiful overlap even when you think about um, uh, the first kind of <clears throat> incursion in Canaan is praise around Jericho and marching around singing praise. And, um, and the fact I think too, that we even often miss is, um, there's kind of no category when the nation of Israel is doing something Old Testament in which their kids are not involved intimately. The families are crossing, you know, they're, they're being <laughs> taken through the Red Sea, um, not sort of held off waiting if they decide they want to come or not. Um, but one of the things I think that always really comes through in your book, which I think is really beautiful is the sense that children are needed members of the body in worship within yeah, the church. Honest questions. Yeah, and they exactly they ask honest questions. They bring a beauty, a curiosity, and and a, a true sincerity that I think sometimes you know parents can lose. And um, and and one of the questions that I had, and because you've been doing seminars, you wrote the first edition in '93, right? Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so um, certainly there's been you mentioned the kind of commodifications and uh, the separation of families, even through education and things like that. And but there's also been a sort of a changing mores and, you know, parenting expectations or methods over the past, you know, 20, 30 years. And, and so I was just wondering if what you have seen um, in doing seminars and speaking with people, if uh, a lot of the things you sort of. Um, ask as implied understanding within any parent that this is how you train children. The expectation is that they're trained, that they're led, that they have expectations given to them. For example, I think on page 57, you say kids work best when they have expectations given to them. I don't know if in parenting in 2019, if parents actually make that assumption. And I was just wondering if what changes you've seen just in communicating that. Well, I have. Um, I think that um, there's kind of two camps, and both are equally at work, and good camps, equally at work sometimes in the church. We have in where it can be afforded in a lot of communities to stay at home parents, where mm -hmm. one parent will stay home. And they tend to, just because of the constant proximity of children, fall more naturally into enunciating expectations and helpfulness and aid to kids. Yeah. Um, but a whole lot of uh, our folk uh, are two income families, uh, sometimes by necessity, sometimes by giftedness or choice. And so children aren't day by day around the clock influenced by those, and they're usually in situations either at school, certainly, but also preschools and even infant care and things like that, 
um, child care situations where they're not just the only kids. So there's only so much you can do. There's only so much intentionality. And we have to be gentle with those things because all families have real reasons and certainly acceptable reasons. Um, sure. A lot of churches even sponsor Mother's Days out and stuff like that to give a break. Or Father's Days out to give a break. But, um, yeah, we have to, yeah, I think families are families. And one thing I do at the seminar is really take lots of Q&A. And, well, in my situation, da 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 but I do think it's okay to encourage, at least where Sunday sometimes and sometimes Saturdays are the high contact days for a lot of people. Sure. Right? Yeah. And so to make the most of those moments. And uh, in a Christian family, the most of those moments may be with the church family. And so um, I think sometimes um, parents get so used to shoveling or carting their children off to be cared for by other people that they feel a little intimidated sometimes by the times when they really have to parent their own kids. And I'm sympathetic with that. But I also want to say and of course at my age I can say this gently but hopefully insightfully they're grown up the day after tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Try ask God for the insight to see what He is doing. If His Word is present, then evangelical, we are big on the Word and the teaching of the Word, the reenactment of the Word in sacraments. That God's Word will not return to Him void, even in our kids, even in sometimes the littlest of our kids. In the book, I recommend that children go full time from the time they're about four years of age. And because that's a very teachable time, but keep them in there for as long as possible. And then sometimes after a children's sermon or the offering or something like that, um, you know, they can go to age appropriate talk about things. Um, but from the age of four on up, they can listen to a sermon. They can learn to listen to a sermon. Yeah, they're going to be squirmy sometimes. It takes all of us to learn how to listen. And not all of us know everything. God is at work in this world and in, 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 in this people. And he does that by the word. The word uh, read, preached, reenacted. And what God can do unseen, sometimes very human in our children, will bear fruit. Will bear fruit. And we trust God in those very limited and precious times to remind kids that they belong to the congregation as a whole. Yeah. And not just their subgroup. Mm-hmm. I think that I really prophesied in the first edition, as it turned out, was that if we keep shoveling our kids off, they will only ever belong to their group. Yeah, absolutely. They Sunday school, and then they go to youth group, which sometimes the youth houses across the parking lot or across the street are in a separate building because that's, you know, you can play the drums loud and nobody will complain. You know, we tend to separate off. Then you go to college, and then you're in your college group, or you don't go at all because the college you go to is a Christian college and they have chapel, and that serves as a fine substitute. And then they come out of college, right? And of course, uh, both uh, Pew and, and um, Barna have said that what I predicted was true, that they then were going to graduate from college. And then they, well, you know, they're still Christians and they still love the Lord and they want to be Christians. And so they visit congregation after congregation after congregation. And I just haven't found a, and I hear this all the time, I just haven't found a congregation where I really feel like it used to feel. Yeah. Well, it's because you've never belonged to the congregation. Sure. And so one of two things happen. They never return, which is huge in the barn study. Or they just start their own church. And you yes. just continue, you know, church my way, or what I call church our way, cow church or wow church, worship our way. Because this is this feels more like it. And what do you end up with? 
very small tribal groups of absolutely the same kind of people at the same age um, yeah. in these tiny little congregations that are really an extension of youth groups. In fact, if that's a, that's a really insightful insight. I mean, I, fascinating. You also see that often those churches are hyper focused on certain subsets, either theologically or missionally, and um, it's becoming very rare, oftentimes, to find intergenerational churches. Um, even the largest churches that seem to be intergenerational, and what they're really doing is they're um, putting the different groups of people into these subsets and ministering to them. Um, in a sort of commodified way. And of course that causes fewer problems. There's fewer, I mean, I asked a student of ours one time and, um, why she came to a funeral of an old lady in our congregation. This was our congregation here in Silo Springs. But I, I, this, what, this lady that had died and was having a funeral that my husband did in, in our sanctuary had been in a nursing home for a lot of years, and I wondered how did this student know her? This student who had been coming, you know, to to our congregation, and um, so I asked her afterwards. I said, you know, how did you know Miss Maggie? And she goes, Oh, I didn't. But this is the first church. She called it a church. It's a congregation. There's only one church, but that's another topic. <laughs> I, I came to this church, and I really love it because there's old people in here, and I. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow. And she said, "Whoa!" And I said, "Are what did you learn? What did it feel like to you?" And she said, "Of course, this is a reflection of my husband's wonderful ministry." She said, "Oh, I was really surprised. It was a worship service, mm-hmm. and everything this May's life was focused on God, and so was my Yeah. And that was just shocking to her, and I just. Yeah. As a child about God's faithfulness in the faith of growing old, and children appropriate to see and understand and So, so what would you say to folks that are going to you know more of a seeker sensitive? Model that doesn't have a strong overt theology of worship. Now, I, and we'll probably get into Smith in a little bit, but you know, I would argue that everybody has some form of litur- liturgy, whether they recognize it or not. There, there are always practices and you know formational habits that are happening in a service or a life. Um, but in terms of the you know high church, low church type of you know overt understanding of, of liturgy, what do you tell the parents that are in that sort of an environment? Right. Well, it depends on how they ask the question. I think for our purposes here, I was uh, a staff member with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship for 17 years, and I could do evangelism. I shared the gospel and led a lot of people that the midwife and their rebirth is the spirit work of them. Um, and I love evangelistic services. I believe in seeker services. What I challenge, and I have done parenting the the leaders and the pastoral staff oh keep doing what you're doing just don't call it a worship service in other words what you're doing is a good and right thing but worship services are not your services because worship services are focused on the Lord and what he and how he has asked to be worshipped in another book that was just published um, a lot of five years ago Story Shaped Worship is my grown up book on worship theology. And I do deal with just what you said, Sam, um, that every congregation has some sort of liturgy, but is it story shaped? And what I mean by story shaped is from the beginning of the law and Israel, the sacrificial system, what emerges in synagogues and eventually the temple, and then ongoing in the early church. There is a pattern that God has requested in how he prefers to be worshipped. And a story-shaped worship service is a story that reflects the first act of worship. 
worship that God received in Scripture, which is in Genesis chapter 4, when Abel reenacts the salvation of his family in the sacrifice of an animal. He reenacted God's grace to him. And ever since then, then God worked all that into his law and the prophets and the development of the worship of Israel and on into the early church because they were all uh, Jew, Jewish Christians in the beginning. And all this shapes the early church, that there's a shape. To, God has every right to tell us, um, I like to be worshipped in without idols, right? Now, everybody would agree with that, right? Without idols. But what we do in a lot of worship services, we go right back to the golden calf. We decide worship our way. Well, it's yeah. easier to worship the God that you can see, so give us your jewelry. We'll do this, and we'll still call it Yahweh. But that and that and that, we still do that. Yeah. And instead, God has said, this is what I want from you. And when the church pays attention to the biblical outline of the worship of the um, then we're actually giving, and that's what makes a worship service a worship service. We are worshiping the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God of biblical faith. And that can make a really big difference in people. So, yes, have um, services that are designed for seekers and evangelists, because that can honor the Lord too, absolutely. But they're designed for a different reason. And I think only problem is when worship services begin to be first of all audience focus and where the people on the and we even call it the stage become the chief actors and so yeah. preachers get big heads because only I can do it so and worship leaders become performers and all of a sudden I might as well have gone to a Christian concert and yeah, I can have a good time there, but don't call it worship. Worship must be biblically grounded and biblically shaped. It will be in the gospel. And a biblically shaped worship service reenacts the gospel from call to benediction, shapes the gospel. And that's in my book, Story Shaped Worship. Um, right on, I love it. So the readers might find that a good kind of a biblical theology of worship. Yeah, yeah, I'll link to that in the show notes page for sure and if anybody wants to check that out. Did you have something, Josh? Uh, well, I was just going to say one of the things I, that I love about um, Parenting the Pew is so full and rich of that kind of um, parenting wisdom that part of the goal in parenting children, we have to consider what are the ends to which we're parenting them towards. And and so it's really coming out in the exact same way that you're talking about worship and the worship service, that there's not a sense in which we enter into something that's primarily for ourselves. We're actually entering into something that has the end, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the worship of the Triune God. And, um, and I was just... I think that's like maybe a connection here to a lot of other things. There's a big growth right now, maybe in the evangelical church or maybe even in just this kind of stage of, you know, American Christianity where people like James K. A. Smith and others are, are talking about the need for, um, liturgical practices, habituated, um, shaping of desires and loves. And, and I was just wondering what, interaction you have with some of that and um and and how you feel like that maybe is kind of hand in glove stuff with with parenting yes. and you and seth sorry if i overran your question here in asking that but well that it's a great question and james k a smith uh i met him had a brief conversation with him but boy are we on the same page in a lot of ways and an interactive service a service where the whole um body literally our physical bodies is involved um, has long biblical tradition um, and it doesn't have to come off like stuffiness or high church or stilted or rigid and James K. Smith makes very 
much uh, uh, differentiates from that. He's a he's a recovering Calvinist, you know, where things were very rigid, but also very brain. Yeah. Um, his tradition that he comes out of is very prone, and we have to be very careful the way I say this and the way we think about this. That what I believe saves me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's who you believe in that saves you. Mm-hmm. But we are not saved by cognitive assent or cognitive knowledge. James in the New Testament says the devil knows it all. Yeah. But does not trust, does not bend the knee. He just trembles. Right? And so James K. A. Smith is very good at wanting the whole of our life to be involved in a response to God. And in worship, yes, there is cognitive content to worship because the scripture is read and thought through and there can be an exegesis. But also, there's benediction. And so to teach children and families to hold their hands out to receive the blessing of God at the end of a worship service involves our hands, too. Um, When we stand for this, when we tell a congregation that a call to worship is antiphonal. Mm-hmm. It's uh, a response either between a worship leader in a congregation or men and women or adults and children. You can do it a variety of wonderful ways. Within the set pattern of story shaped worship, there can be tremendous variety of how you do that. You just don't lose the shape of that. But it's antiphonal. Why? Because the seraphs before the throne of grace in the Hebrew, saying, holy, holy, holy Lord. And you can tell in the pattern of the original language of the Old and the Greek and the New Testament um, that that's antithetical singing. One seraph sings this, another seraph sings this, and it goes back and forth and back and forth around the country. And when you tell a kid at junior high school why we go back and forth in the call of worship, very often grounded in the scripture. It's part of a psalm or something like that. And the men read this, and the women read this, and the kids read this, and then the worship leader lives, and then the whole congregation begins and ends it. It's because we're joining the worship pattern that is eternally going on in the heavenly realm. That God is surrounded by the antiphonal singing of his creatures. So, uh, w- would you would you would you think it's fair to say that you know obviously there's there's a variety of ways to implement you know f- habituating practices in a service, and to some extent and it's it's obviously important you know for what those things are in and of themselves, but to some extent it's it's the reasoning behind why you're doing what you're doing that's more important than the thing itself. Yes. Uh, to some extent, you know, like to an some- example that that pops into my head is. You know, maybe a congregation stands for the reading of the word prior to the sermon, and that's because we're there to, you know, to be reverent and have a, a, you know, a focus on what's being preached. And maybe another congregation stands because they know everybody had six donuts and they need to burn a few calories. You know, it's like <laughs> the reason why you do things right. matters, not just that you do that's them. That's right. And you can begin to explain those things to kids. Um, one, uh, one of the many examples that I use in parenting in the pew book is we were at a Holy Thursday service, um, and it was a service of what's called tenebrae, a service of shadows, where there's simply scripture and song and scripture and song, and slowly, with just a few words in between, the story of Jesus' arrest and trials and death is taught uh, to the congregation, but there's a lowering of the lights. That's why they call it a tenebrae. It's the shadows. And all of a sudden, my my uh, Scott, who was I think maybe five years old at the time, mm. um, just started sobbing. I mean, I thought his appendix burst. Just <laughs> nowhere. I mean, he just suddenly. <laughs> You know, like that, it just began just sobbing, and I put my arm around him, and I said, "Scott, what's wrong? What's wrong?" And he goes, "I am, Mama. I'm the reason that Jesus had to 
die. My heart is throbbing. Hmm. Well, and he didn't say that quietly. He said it <laughs> at the level of his sobbing. And a lot of people in the congregation heard it. Hmm. And I didn't dispute with them. I didn't say to him, oh, yeah, honey, no, you're so cute. You're okay. God loves you anyway. No, I said, you're right. And Mama has a girl. And we're all the reason why Jesus had to die. But all of a sudden in that worship service where the senses were involved, the yeah. were involved, the, the whole ambience of the sanctuary grew darker as Jesus got closer mm-hmm. to the The Holy Spirit used that in my son's life to break his heart over his own four-year-old, five-year-old sin. And I didn't dissuade him from that moment. I said, but Jesus loves you, and that's why he can do it. Yes, yeah. but this is why. Well, the whole congregation, other people, you can hear sniffs and people blowing their nose. And a little child will lead us. I mean, he had the response. Why weren't we all crying? Why weren't all of our hearts broken over sin? And I think Scott on that night allowed the Lord's Spirit to break other people's hearts, too. Yeah. And he, he felt what we all should have felt. And God was honored, God was blessed, the Lord was loved, and Scott's life never changed. Uh, he, he was, you know, I mean, he was not a perfect child. He had, you know, every reason to uh, understand sin as he grew up, but... He's a pastor now in the EPC church on the Gulf Coast in Ocean Spring, Mississippi. He still preaches the word and he does not refrain from preaching sin. And I think that's usually if you have a style break, this might be another topic and I won't go on and on about it. But sometimes you'll have a contemporary service and a traditional service in a lot of congregations. Sure. Just make sure the shape stays the same. And that in your contemporary service, you, the first thing that usually goes is the confession of sin. Yeah. And no, we probably need that time in our worship services, and it's an appropriate part of the movement of biblical worship. Um, and we don't read the Word of God until after the confession of sin in a worship service that's shaped by Scripture, because we don't have ears to hear until we have confessed our sin. Mm-hmm. And see the outline of this even in Isaiah 6 where he he needs his in his sense of his tongue I dwell among the people of unclean lips and I am yeah. of unclean lips after he confesses that he hears the word of the Lord and it's a very hard word to hear too one that he says how long do I have to do this you know <laughs> comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's right. Isaiah was comfortable when he walked in to that prayer meeting. Uh, oh, there's so much in Isaiah 6. Have you ever thought about the reality of in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah 6 1. Uzziah died because he manufactured worship on his own. As a king, one of the longest ruling kings in Israel, he decided, and he was, oh, he was very popular, and he wanted to see what it was like to be a priest. Well, the kings of Judah were from the tribe of Judah, not from the Levites. And in the year King Uzziah died, I had the experience initiated by God. That's why we start with a call to worship. Hmm. Call. We don't just show up and call God to meet us. He has called us to meet him. Right? And so mm-hmm. Isaiah just goes to the temple. And in that space, he has this vision of the Lord. But Uzziah, in the year that he died, two years before that, had peeked behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies because he wanted to see the ark and he was stricken with leprosy. And he died of leprosy. So Isaiah 6, which is really a beautiful picture of sevenfold movement I saw the Lord high and lifted up mm-hmm. I didn't 
just see the ark behind the curtain. I saw the holy room of heaven. And that's how that whole thing starts. And there's this call, there's this praise, the seraphs are holy, holy, holy. And then Isaiah, I don't deserve to be here. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then we have that confession of sin. And then the Lord's declaration of absolution through the tongue of the seraphs that come and touch his filthy. The burning coal, yeah. Then he hears the word of the Lord. Then he responds to the word of the Lord. And then he goes out with God's blessing and benediction to do the word of the Lord. That's a worship service. That's a worship service. And it's and it just was a beautiful illustration there in Isaiah 6 of this sevenfold um, movement. Of, um, hmm. Yeah, and that pattern shows up all over the scriptures. You see that in Revelation. You see that in Genesis 1 and 2, 3. I mean, don't yeah. Don't eliminate the confession of sin just because you want people to feel comfortable in the worship service. Sometimes we need to remember we are sinners and we should not be comfortable in the worship service because we are unworthy people to be except for the work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So speaking of being comfortable, I want to take it back to some of the, the practical tips and guidance that you give about having having kids in worship. So you say training children to worship does not always enhance our own experience of being before the Lord, especially at first. So you, know, you talk about there's some practical things related to having your kids sit with you, not having them, you know, have access to, to knickknacks to, you know, entertain themselves during the service, uh, you know, coming alongside them physically, you know, know when you know wrapping them up when they're you're reading the word or you're singing the hymns or or whatever tell me about some of those practical suggestions yeah those are are really helpful for kids provoke not by children to wrath let alone uh, misbehaving and sometimes i i do say children should have in their hands the same thing that the congregation has in their hands Mm -hmm. Um, share the info with them help them do that and I also have learned uh, through the years that when most people object to children worship, it's because they're distracting, right? That's the big complaint. Yeah. Um, children are usually distracting when they're not worshiping, when they're finding Waldo in a book, when they're running a truck up and down the pew, when they're playing with a Game Boy, when they're with their, you know, whatever technology and they're killing green pigs or something and <laughs> that you know it's the, the phone is on silence but it's still rather distracting one of the points that I make when I'm asked about that is children who are being trained to worship are rarely distracting because the parent is there they're involved now they can be um, but sometimes like with my illustration with Scott they can right, yeah. in a very helpful way but most people who are prone to will not complain about children whose parents are involved with them, whispering to them, uh, putting their arm around them and saying, okay, now here comes the the, uh, offering plate. And uh, one of the things I recommend as a practical thing, Seth, for you, is that children prepare from the very beginning a their own envelope, a small little envelope, either the kind the church has or, you know, buy a small thing of envelopes at a cheap store and let children put their own pennies and nickels, teach them to tithe really early. So when my kids, they got a dime a week for, you know, putting their toys back in a toy box, they would put a penny. It was funny when they'd say, can I get Jesus my nickel too? And I'd, I'd act all, really? Really, you want to oh, put it in? He's going to be so excited. You know, so they put a you know penny and maybe their nickel in the, <laughs> and then I tell them they can decorate it any old way they want for Jesus, you know, and write your name on it so he knows it's from you, and you can help them write their name. Even when they're just learning to write. Well, what's the difference when the? Here comes the plate. You've prepared them for that moment, yeah. and. They decorated their envelopes, you know, and sometimes the Lord had to receive an envelope from my children that had sharks in the water, and <laughs> airplanes, you know, you know, I was, I only had boys. I sometimes during the 
offering. I wished I'd had a girl, so <laughs> butterflies and flowers. But you know, I, they were who they were, and the Lord knew them and loved them. So Jesus got all kinds of envelopes. But the difference is, not only am I teaching my children to tithe, I in that moment I wasn't thinking about who they were going to be twenty years later. Still tithing. I just wanted them to be involved in that moment, so that it wasn't just you know, me digging in the, my pocket or the bottom of my coin purse to give them something. You know, that's training children to give God spare change. Now, parents don't mean, I, don't, I didn't mean to do that, but that's what they're doing. If you don't think about the elements, what's happening during an offering? It's, it's the widow's mind in with the billionaire's check. It's our offering as a congregation. And my child's penny in a little envelope with all you know their stuff on it is as precious to the Lord as the rich guy in the front pew who's an elder and can afford to give a thousand bucks a week. It's biblical, right? Mm-hmm. And plus the child learns I can give. I can participate. And Jesus loves my penny. And I always taught the kids it's the bright penny. Give Jesus the shiny penny. When my son graduated from seminary, he called us to tell us about his first call as a pastor, and it was to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, ravaged by Hurricane Katrina. Mm. I said, Scott, why that church? He got the preaching prize in his seminary, the kid can punish. And I was just like, this is a really different kind of call. I mean, it was just ravaged on this Gulf Coast. He has three kids, right? At the time, one of already out and so the mother in me wanted to say can't you go to a place that will pay you more <laughs> I mean, it was but, I'm, and, but my son just stopped me in my track I said why that call Scott he goes mom it's a shiny pen and I said what do you mean he said give God what he wants the most and what he wants the most is usually found Mm-hmm. What had he learned all those years? I just wanted him to participate in those five seconds of a worship service. <laughs> but God was at work in him. Hmm. Yeah. Later, is shaping him from those little baby moments that I had not even thought all the way through. So, well, if parents trust. Oh, Seth, you can encourage your listeners to help parents trust their children to the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and to what He can do, see and unseen, in the life of their children. Just keep watching and praying and having faith in what God can do. You had asked earlier, Josh, about the goal of worship. Yeah. Well, for me, I didn't want to raise safety kids. There's, there's more to raising Christian kids than virginity and a lack of drugs. I wanted to raise men of God. I wanted to have children who grow up into robust discipleship, to stand and to take a stand in this culture that needs to hear the word of the word and to see in their lives a disciple of Jesus Christ in every dimension. And I Worship was a part of it. Because I think you can only do that if you know the God is. Amen. Hmm. I, I also wanted to ask you about um, specifically your chapter on the Eucharist, on communion, and, and training children up into that. And I, and I wanted to ask how it connects to sort of your, your soteriology. Um, and I don't know if, if that's gonna if that makes sense yet, but um, I grew up in a church where it was very much what what you described or what you advocate in in your chapter, which is you know do not do not you know examine your heart, do not take it in, in an unwilling manner. Um, you know you need to understand what you're doing before you do it, and you know if if the if the plate comes by or you know you're about ready to get in line, you know to go get the bread, um, and your heart's not right. 
you need to pass and, you know, and, and be consistent and be honest about that. Um, and so that's what, that's what I grew up in. And then, um, I know that there's also sort of more of a, a, you know, covenantal approach to, you know, raising children in the church and participating in the sacraments and sort of what I've, what I've shifted towards a little bit is the concept of, you know, bringing my kids from a very early age into participating in communion from a perspective of, you know, this is what we do as Christians, as followers of Jesus. This is part of worship. Obviously, you know, you don't fully understand all, all the mechanics or the, the theology of what's going on, but, but right. But it's a, it's about, you know, covenantal family participation. I, and, but I feel like there's a tension there between that approach and, and what I was raised and what you're advocating in the book. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Yeah, um, I get asked this a lot, and I think you can do it either way. Um, I think that um, when children, here's the however, in other words, your parents took time to explain to you this is what's happening, and they invited you, just like I did with the offering, for you to participate in that. Okay? I think mm-hmm. the Lord can work in that and honor that, no problem at all. Mm-hmm. But it's when, and here's the however, when parents just, there's no instruction, and it's just this is what we do, and you're just welcome, and there's no sense of the cross behind them. There's no mm-hmm. sense of do this in remembrance of what I have done for you, right? And if you're not offered something to remember in those moments, I think the reason that I hesitated, and, and I do um, advocate in the book, um, that children wait to participate in communion, baptized children, wait to participate in communion until they really can, at least in a primary way, share their faith on their own two feet. Um, Now, all children can be brought to that moment either way. I think the way I thought it through as a pastor's wife with pastor's kids, was I felt always I had a higher wall to get over, to show our kids we're not just doing this because your daddy's the pastor. Mm-hmm. Not just going through the motions, or we're not just obeying somebody else's expectation. I really wanted, through prayer and then through practice, my kids to never go through the motions just because they're PK, but to really grow into their faith. So in the book, I do reflect on my experience with my kids. Mm -hmm. And I talk about anticipation builds. It's helpful. We anticipate birthdays. We don't have birthdays every day or every week. We don't have Christmas every day or every week. I wanted my children to really see taking communion with the congregation with a primary understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I wanted them to anticipate that moment that you can give an offering, you can sing the hymns, you can do everything. But this piece is a more mature piece. Now, none of us understand the mystery of the Lord's Supper, what Mm -hmm. really happens there. I mean, they've been fighting over it since, you know, forever, right? You even see that in Corinthians, where the Corinthians wanted to co-opt in a certain way, and Paul steps in and goes, no, no, no. You know, so this is always a hot topic. But, so there is a mystery. God is doing something here. Mm -hmm. Spirit, presence of the word, I am a Presbyterian. Um, Deeper than we know. And that's true for the oldest person in the congregation, let alone a child. So it's, it's not based on cognitive ability but social identification, that you really belong to this congregation. And you do so on the basis of faith. You recognize that you're not a good little boy, and that you need the saving cross of Jesus Christ and the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit in your life to come to this table. It takes a while, I think, for children to go there. But I have, as long as it's explained to children and they're supported in that, I think there's grace to do that in a variety of ways. But it's just when it's treated like a 
someone rather public has recently said um, that they've never asked God for forgiveness, but I've had my little cracker and my taste. Dare not speak his name. I don't want to speak <laughs> but I, I How does that compute? Yeah. How does that compute? And no person listening to your prod- podcast said would willingly and consciously ever do that. Parents want to be good parents. So the admonition is, tell your kids why you're doing what you're doing and for what reason you do it. And yeah. communion is a lot about the cross. I mean, you asked me to tie it to my soteriology, and that is, I stand with Paul. Um, except for what Christ has done for us, we're lost. Mm-hmm. And that Jesus loved us while we were his enemies. That he's loved us since before the foundations of the world, he says. The God who loved us first, we love because he loved us first, right? I mean, the whole of the New Testament especially explicates that, that we are only here by grace. And mm-hmm. we come to the table because of grace. We come to worship because of grace. We're responding to God's call. He has made a way for us into the Holy of Holies because our great high priest goes in front of us. And that's my soteriology is that Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners of which I am chief. And I want my kids to realize they're chief too and that we're all lost except for the work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we only know this by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, not by just our cognitive dependence. That's not faith. Mm -hmm. Faith has to trust. And so I think I took a delay tactic with my kids. And I think it's because they were my kids. And I do think this can work with a lot of other people's kids, too. That we're not just going through the motions here. Mm-hmm. This is a high point of Christian worship. And I really think it's responsible not just to you, but to God to make sure that the first time you come, you come having thought on your sin. Mm-hmm. You up to reflect what you're called to remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Scott, Rob, what do you remember about why we do this? Yeah. And I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me even before I was me. Mm-hmm. And you need to be able to say that to other people, your brothers and sisters around you at the table. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that ends up being the common theme through a lot of this is that surely the the what is important, but the what is is m- made most important by the why behind it. There are a lot of what's. There are a lot of ways to take community. There are a lot of ways to structure a service, but it, it's the it's the what and the the reasoning behind that informs it that really uh, affects whether it's useful or legitimate or you know orthodox. Yeah. I can add one thing to that. Really good insight, Seth, and that's the why sometimes is very intimidating to parents. So that's why they go to Sunday school, or that's why we're going to call the pastor. In other words, we live in a culture of speciality. We hire a choir can sing because they have good voices. This guy can, you know, or this person can do this because he's had education in it or whatever. Well, we, we live in a very, I can't do that, I haven't had training in it, da, 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 da. And frankly, parenting in the book is, is a manual for training parents to be able to think through to why, to help parents know what to say when their child says, why did Jesus have to die for me? And he didn't even know me. You know, that's an honest question. Jesus lived a long time ago and he doesn't know me. How does a parent answer that? Um, and a lot of times it's okay to go to your elders uh, or your pastor in the church and say, you know, my kid asked me this question and I didn't quite know what to say, so I said this. What, what do you think about that? In other words, Christian education has to be ongoing. and But parents need, need help in congregations 
to be able, theology needs to have a big comeback in the church. Our adult education in our congregations needs to be robust. Bible studies every week. Um, Sunday school classes for adults that are really shaped by the historical and biblical theology of the church that we need to raise our expectations for what we do know even as adults, as parents in the church, so that we feel a little more equipped to answer the why questions questions that our children will answer but in the meantime, yeah ask for help, it's okay and go to your pastor and have a conversation with elder in your church, or an older person in your church who's raised kids. What did you do when your child did blah, blah, blah? You know, they might have some good ideas. So parents do need help. It does take, I don't know if it takes a village, but it sure takes a congregation to raise a Christian. And uh, congregations that know the names of the children and uh, what their parents do for a living. Grandparents in a congregation, especially for people with more than two kids, um, Christian grandparents who maybe their whole family lives away from them now sit with parents who have children and offer to help out. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, cause we, we have a focus on intergenerational worship at the, the evangelical free church that I attend. And, um, you know, one of the things that they've cited a number of times is uh, supposedly research has indicated that, uh, one of the indicators for whether a, a, a kid walks away from the church after he leaves high school or college and sticks around is whether he had at least, there were, there were two adults in the congregation that were not his parents or were not his youth leaders that knew his name and could actually have a conversation with him and, and knew him, was in his life. That's right. Big studies have been done. One of my colleagues at JBU has a, his PhD was on mentorship, Christian mentorship. Mm-hmm. You know, and as a youth group, when our kids were old enough for youth group, junior high, high school, Breck and I, uh, that's when we didn't volunteer with the youth anymore. But we raised up elders and other people and skilled them in the congregation to take over the junior high and high school youth group um, and, and went on from there. But uh, just because we knew that very thing, that our kids need to hear other adults tell them what we've already told them because they do look for other people during those growing seasons of their life. So very, very true. Yeah, and um, encourage you know godly, elderly people in congregations. Sometimes they're a little nervous with quote, modern parents, because it seems so different to them, and it is in a lot of ways, but just be an extra grandma to them. Uh, the kids in our church call me Aunt Robbie. Aunt Robbie, my dog bit my finger. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the finger. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so they all call me Aunt Robbie, and, and you know, I, and a lot of the elderly people in our congregation, um, I sometimes have to What's the name of the baby? What's the name of that new baby? And I know who to go ask um, because there's a couple of uh, people in our congregation who did, they're just good names. And they'll say, it's Naomi. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. So then I'll go see little Naomi out. <laughs> great. Well, this this has been really, really great. Josh, do you have anything to add here or ask before we wrap up? I just think your, your book is um – it's aged so well, and I think it's so appropriate for um, particularly uh, this generation of Christians in America as we kind of enter into a real post-Christian age, and we really have to think about how do we raise our children in a way that is um, that the very style of our worship and the style that we raise our kids communicates to God's kingdom and to the gospel to a world that um, in many ways around us is kind of heading a different direction. And I think it just syncs up well with so much of um, similar thoughts. Um, of How old are your kids? So I've got an eight-year-old, uh, a, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, yes, good trainable ages. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and I've, I've, I've got... I've got 10, 8, 5, and almost 1. Oh, wonderful ages. I'm glad you guys have hopefully found, you know, continue to find the book helpful for you and share it with others in your congregation. When, when Parenting in the Pew parents help inaugurate and help other parents do this, then the support naturally grows in the congregation uh, mm-hmm. for having children 
uh, in the pew. You don't feel like you're the only parent that's keeping your four-year-old in the service when, no, all the four-year-olds are in the service. And um, the one thing you don't want to do as they grow up is let them sit next to their best friend. That's real distracting. And uh, Well, just to, um, just to let you know as well, when we were reading Parenting the Pew and we were going to talk about um, interviewing you and all that started coming together, um, I was able to just to go into our church's um, children's ministry um, office, and your book was on the shelf, and it's been integral to our church. I'm a PCA pastor in Austin, Texas, and so um, it's been very influential in the way that we've tried to form our, um, you know, kind of children's church during the sermon. That they're trained in worship, while that you know, in an age appropriate way for them, so that they're participating as well and the ways that we encourage our parents to um, train their children and for worship and so thank you for your work um, around the country uh, and now it depends on your baptismal theology whether you baptize infants children or, yes sir. or um, <laughs> both are seen in the scripture not a problem but a lot of times uh, believers baptism is um, preceded by infant dedications and things like that. So mm-hmm. it goes with either kind of congregation, but either at a dedication or a baptism of a child in a family. The congregation, a gift besides a certificate or, you know, congregation yeah. things, also give parenting in the view. Hmm. Because most of the times there's uh, promises given to you. Promise best of your ability to raise this child in mm-hmm. the admonition of the Lord. Yes, we do. Yeah. So you'll ask the parents the question. The, the, the parents say, how do we do that? <laughs> how do we do that? And so the, church, the congregation is actually giving the parents to help you keep your vow, to help you yeah. keep your promise. This is a gift for you. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Great. So... So, Robbie, if, if anybody is listening and wants to check out uh, your other books or maybe they want to reach out to you about a seminar at, at their church, how what's the best way to find you on the Internet? Um, you can Google me, Robbie.Castleman, uh, or just Robbie Castleman, and my name will come up. Um, I have a very neglected uh, blog space uh, called In His Glad Service, or but it comes up if you just Google my name. Um, if you go to Christian bookstores, a lot of those books are carried there, and if not, they'll order them. Um, you can go to Amazon.com. I like to mention brick and mortar stores first. Um, but Amazon, there's a pat- there's a page there for authors and stuff. So there's quite a few ways to get. Uh, and you can always. Uh, Email me, just email me. Uh, I answer my own email. I've never, never had an agent or done anything like that. I like to just pray about everything that comes along. I'd love to come to you guys as congregations and yeah, that'd be sweet. Yeah, teach your yeah. kids and put my arm around your wives. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's lots of different ways. If you just Google me, you'll and my my email address uh, is still good at John Brown University, so it'll come up that I'm. Great. We'll link to all that on the show notes. So thank you so much for for your work and for your willingness to talk and your time, and we really appreciate it. The Lord bless you and keep you and yours. You thank failed. you, Robbie. I always thank say you. my kids weren't perfect, but uh, and none of us are. And they had their moments when I wanted their DNA tested. But <laughs> uh, I always pray at the end of my seminars that... Every parent in the room or every grandparent in the room will know a time when our sons and daughters become our brothers and sisters. Mm. Mm. And when I look at my boys, I'm always their mama. And they're always my sons. But my greatest joy is that they are my brothers in Christ. Because mm. that's the answer to the prayer. And to all the effort that went into parenting. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. That's great. Hey, your children become your brothers and sisters. Well, folks, that's it for Episode 7. Thanks again to Dr. Castleman for graciously giving her time to our little corner of the podcast universe. 
Uh, she was truly a joy to engage with, and I know Josh and I had a great time. If you want to check out Dr. Castleman's books that were mentioned in this episode, Parenting in the Pew, Story Shaped Worship, or Interpreting the God-Breathed Word, head on over to the show notes page at closedmindedpodcast.com slash seven. And with that, go forth and read widely, seeking truth and applying it to your life. See you next time. I wish upon you truth And all you feel is doubt I hope you know that an open mind still knows when to shut things out. I wish upon you a brave that will always rise above. But most of all, 